It's all multi. Right. There's a lot of babbling. Everyone's very excited. Good morning, everyone. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the chief executive of the Resolution Foundation. I spent the morning having my teeth drilled by a dentist. So this is going to have to be a lot more fun to average up the day. If everyone could be perky, the, the audience are worried you're going to go to sleep in your chairs. There's a lesson for them, which is be better at performing. There's a lesson for all of you, which is some of this is quite serious. Stay awake. But, right, here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to start off giving you a headline summary of some of the number crunching we've done this morning about what the election results can tell us. Some of that is blindingly obvious. I'm still going to repeat it because it's a very big deal. Um, but then there's some stuff which is slightly less obvious. And then we're going to have a discussion, uh, kicking off with Rachel Sylvester, political columnist at The Times, followed by Raf Baer, political columnist at The Guardian, and then Tim Bale, who is not a political columnist yet, but is Professor of Politics at Queen Mary University of London. So that is the plan. And then we're going to have a conversation uh, with you guys. So let's start on the um, actual election results, because in some ways... This election is very, very, very straightforward. We've got a Conservative Party running the same election campaign as in 2017, but without the incompetence, and it worked. And we've got a Labour Party running an election campaign that doesn't try to deal with its own weaknesses or with the big questions facing the country, and it doesn't. And that's broadly uh, what is going on. These are the results you'll have seen. All this. So on the left-hand side, you've got change in the vote share, and on the right-hand side, you've got change in seats, seats that have moved, changed hands. The, uh, the big news is the fall in the Labour vote, but that fall in the Labour vote is allowing a growth in a Conservative seats, because in the end, someone's got to hold these seats, and this is a two-party system. But the news on vote share is a Conservative fall, leaving Scotland aside um, for a second. So that's the thing you already know. Now I'm going to tell you something else you already know, but I think it is worth really, really thinking on. This is really not normal. Okay, so this chart is showing you the seats won or lost by oppositions in elections since the 1920s. So the first thing to say is generally uh, these lines are going up. I, in general, oppositions take seats. They don't lose seats. That is how this is meant to work. That's why it's called a political cycle and not called a one-party state. Okay? Now... What this chart is showing you there's, is the latest election. These ones are red not because of Labour. They're just red to make you pay attention to them. Okay? There's one election since the 1920s uh, when an opposition party has lost seats on the uh, more seats than it did last night, and that is 1983, okay? which is the Margaret Thatcher's landslide after getting in in 1979. She's won a war. Various other things are going on. The, um, so that is the only time that gets um, close to this. And I think that, that even that doesn't do justice to the difference. Okay. The, um, this election, which is showing green, is 1987, is the last time you get close to a, a result where you've got an incumbent opposition, an opposition that's been in opposition for a long period, like they have been, so nine years. In 1987, they Labour have been in opposition for eight years. They still lost by 10 percentage points, so not dissimilar to the loss for Labour last night. The, um, uh, but they actually gained seats because they'd lost so badly in 1983 and the alliance collapsed. But, the, um, but my main point is, once you have been in opposition for nine years, historically, you do not lose seats. That is really hard to do. And I want to reinforce that again, which is even in 1987, similar length of time in opposition, the fact that the, the Labour didn't do very well nationally was against this backdrop. So this is showing you the economic backdrop to the election. In grey is 1987, and in red is today. So on the left, house prices surging. Britain was booming in 1987, unless you were either living in a place with lots of unemployed people or were unemployed. Most of the country was booming. House prices were going through the roof, 15-point growth in the year before. Uh, um, incomes were growing by 5% in 1987, and real GDP was growing by 1.5% a quarter. Okay. The country was booming, and that's the last time an opposition did badly on the scale of what we saw yesterday on vote share. And then, even then, it didn't do as badly on the seat share. So... What is then going on at a regional level? So I think this is slightly more complicated than some of what everyone has wanted to talk about, Labour losing in the north for most of this election and the Tories winning in the north. So there's definitely chunks of that going on, but I think we should be clear 
it's not quite as straightforward. So Labour has had a bad time everywhere and has definitely lost most votes in the north. The swing against Labour is strongest in the northern regions. Okay? But the Conservative growth is actually strongest in the Midlands. So that's why you're hearing about Bolsover, two, two out of the three Wolverhampton seat, seats flipping to uh, the Conservatives. So the East and the West Midlands is where the Conservative vote actually increased the most. And then across the rest of the country, the story is less about the Conservative vote increasing and more about the Labour vote collapsing, particularly in the North. But even in the South East uh, and London, the place where Labour has done best overnight, the Labour vote is falling um, significantly. Right, now we're getting into slightly techie. So, so this chart is showing you um, on the x-axis how places voted in the EU referendum and on the y-axis the change, the change in the Conservative vote share between, in the blue dots, 2015 and 17, what I'm going to call, that's the first Brexit general election, okay? And the pink line is showing you the change between 2017 and 2019, the change in the second. So, yeah, so these are adding up on top of each other, yeah? So what, what I'm really saying is the first line, so the blue line is telling you that the Conservative vote increased significantly in places that had voted for Leave in 2017. They got their Brexit boost, actually, lots of it in 2017. It is not last night's story. It is 2017's story. That, that was then reinforced this time around. So that happened again. The places where they saw vote share increase it were leave places last night. But most of the growth happened in 2017. The Labour, this is showing you exactly the same chart, but for the Labour share. Okay. So, and again, this one, the red lines are what happened in 2017, and the blue dots and lines are what happened last night. And here, what we're saying is, actually, yes, you've got some effect of Brexit, but it is less, that line is less steep than it is for the Conservative vote share. And it's obviously just very different in the sense that they were get, Labour was gaining seat votes in vote share in 2017. And is losing it more or less everywhere except for very remaining places this time. Yeah. But the line is less steep. Brexit is a less big deal for the Labour vote, uh, and it was definitely a, in particular in 2017. Right, this one's even, is, we're getting into complicated, which is so the short term things that are happening here is, a, is Brexit running into the British Party first past the post system in 2017 and 2019, forcing people into their two camps. Yeah, which is why we've got the two-party share being back up at levels that everybody writing their academic books in the 2000s said would never ever happen again, apart from you, Tim, I'm sure. But basically, everyone, including Tim, wrote that. The, that is a, uh, the, um, that's not fair. But anyway, the, that is like nonsense, because it turns out you can do things to manufacture in the first past the post system, that returning. The, um, but there are other big long-term trends sweeping through our politics, one of which is the growth of age. And the growth of age is a defining, p defining line in who votes so let's just focus on the Conservative vote on the left, and to keep this vaguely manageable, the 2010 lines and dots are showing you the 2010 general election, and the, the red and the uh, purple dots are showing you the 2017 and 2019 general election. So d let's just focus, for the sake of surviving this, on the steepness of the lines. The steeper that line is, the more it matters, it differentiates by place how old you are. Yeah? So the, older the steeper that line is, if you're an older place, the more you're likely you are to vote Labour, and the younger, the less likely you to vote Tory, and the less likely you are to vote Conservative if you're in a young place, is what you're showing. Okay? So young places down here, old places over here, very Tory places, very Labour places. What I'm really showing you here is, one, the Tory line is steep. Okay? So for all of the last decade, older places have been the places voting Conservative. The line steepens after the Brexit election referendum. Yeah, steepens, and it, and it is doesn't do much more this time. A little bit. Labour age generally has been less drastic, so the line is not as steep. But as you can see, the difference is that this time, Labour has been residualised more into younger voters. That Labour age is having a... The age in historically been more important for the Tory vote, but last night, age was really important for the Labour vote because the only places Labour's vote held up was young places. OK? That is what is going on. The... Um, uh, this is the last thing I want to just end on, which is one of the lasting things we're all going to need and the government will need to reflect on is they are now holding a government with a very different coalition to any Conservative government any of us have lived through. The, um, so this is showing you exactly the same kind of thing I just showed you by places looking at their ages, but it's looking at their level of deprivation. Okay? So I'm showing you uh, 
most deprived places on the left and least deprived places on the right-hand side. So what are we seeing? We're seeing that obviously, in general, historically, richer places have voted Conservative and poorer places have not done so. The, um, but this line, this line is becoming, let me get this the right way around, this line has become, uh, this time, is, is, this line is less steep this time than it was in 2017. Yeah. I.e. Labour, the Tories are taking votes, their increases in poorer uh, places. In Labour, there's not a lot going on. But here's another way of thinking about this really concretely. So the average wage in places that voted Conservative in 2017 is £15.38 an hour. Okay? But the average age in places that switched to the Tories last night is £2 an hour lower. Okay? It's like 13 50 ish yeah? Those are different voters, different demographics, they have different wishes, they are much more left-wing on economic issues, and so the coalition that holds that together over five years, when you have already been incumbents for nine years, against that top economic backdrop I've told you about, is different, particularly if Brexit has gone off the table over the course of the five years as an existential issue. Obviously, it's never going away as a governing, you've got to do something about it issue. So that's all. The thing, if I leave you with one thing is, today everyone is talking about Labour, how big the collapse is, is it Brexit or is it Corbyn to blame, which is a stupid conversation, it is clearly both. The, um, uh, but for the longer term, this may be the thing that is more dominant in British politics, which is you've got a Conservative Party running a totally different electoral strategy and coalition to anything they do, it, and they have succeeded against the odds in building that coalition. And the question is, what do they need to do to hold it? So I think we shall wrap up there, and we're going to hear from uh, Rachel first. Over to you, Rachel. You can sit or stand, depending on your preferences. All the best people sit. <laughs> This was obviously a win for Boris Johnson, but it was obviously, too, a defeat for Jeremy Corbyn. And I felt all the way through this campaign, it was really an unpopularity contest rather than a popularity contest. So it was who is the least loathed rather than who is the most liked. And Boris Johnson, you know, this morning in his rally, he, he channeled Blair and he said, talked about a new dawn breaking, a new age arriving, whatever it was. But actually, the, the way in which people were voting was so different to 1997. This was a sort of reluctant endorsement. It was all about get Brexit done. I sat through focus groups where people were saying, I voted Remain, but we've got to get Brexit done. Leavers were saying, I voted Leave. Uh, if it was now another referendum, I'd vote Remain. I think Brexit's going to be a disaster, but we've got to get Brexit done. And there was this sort of, wasn't an enthusiastic endorsement it was a sort of reluctant sense of resignation about uh, this new government. And I think that does affect the political backdrop, particularly in the context of a campaign that was incredibly dishonest, uh, particularly on the Conservative side. So, you know, you had Boris Johnson facing his leaders' debate, uh, asked whether or not trust mattered in politics. He said, yes, the truth is important. The studio audience laughed in his face. Um, meanwhile, Conservative Central Office was putting out a fake... Twitter fact check account, you know, trying to um, put out disinformation about Jeremy Corbyn. So the backdrop to this new government, this new administration, is is very um, tainted and poisonous, really. Uh, so even though Boris Johnson has a hu has a huge majority, unprecedented in some ways, that's partly as a result of the collapse of the Labour, or mainly as a result of the collapse of the Labour Party. Um, the other thing I think is really fascinating is what Boris Johnson means by one nation. So that is really plays into what Torsten was saying at the end there. Um, going back to Disraeli, Conservatives have talked about you know one nation Tory party, but what he means or what he's going to have to mean is very different to what somebody like Nicholas Soames means, a sort of Shire, Tory, patrician, general sense of decency, internationalist, pro-European. That's how Nicholas Soames would define one nation. David Cameron would define one nation as metropolitan, liberal, you know, gay marriage, um, multiculturalism, pro-immigration. That's not what 
the voters who've given Boris Johnson this majority would mean by, you know, they wouldn't use the word one nation, but what that new definition of one nation is going to be. It's, a, it's back in a way to the Disraeli thing of north, south, um, richer, poorer, one nation. But uh, the problem, I think, or one risk for Boris Johnson is that he's defining it in a, uh, he, will, he, he has defined it in quite an English nationalist way. So the way in which he um, blew the dog whistle on immigration, even in the last few days of the campaign, talking about, you know, EU migrants shouldn't feel at home here, shouldn't make them, you know, shouldn't be allowed to feel at home in Britain. Um, and, you know, blowing the dog whistle on the burqa, all these sorts of issues. The, the cultural issues that might play well in one way in the sort of white working class communities will, will make it much harder for him to bring the nation together uh, in the leave remain dynamic, which is also still going on. Uh, and I think um, if you look at the um, vote share last night, in fact, the country's still incredibly divided along leave remain lines. So in um, London and some of the remain supporting constituencies, the Lib Dem vote went up a lot. Uh, at the same time as in the Brexit voting areas, the Tory vote went up a lot. So uh, what does Boris Johnson mean by one nation, I think is going to be a really important question. Is he now going to try and bridge that gap between leave and remain, or is he going to stick to what he sees as one nation, meaning reaching out to working class areas in these sort of new red wall, now Tory blue wall uh, constituencies? Um, and that affects, I think, what he does on Brexit. I think the, the main point about Boris Johnson having a majority is that he is now liberated to be what he wants. And I don't think we quite know, I'm not sure whether he quite knows what that means. Um, so there's now nowhere to hide, if you like. He can't, uh, he can't blame the pesky House of Commons, he can't blame the pesky Remainers, he can't blame the ERG. It's up to him now to define what he wants the party to be, what he wants the country to be, what he wants Brexit to be. Potentially, that gives him much more flexibility over things like whether he's going to ask for a transition, the extension to the transition period in June, uh, or whether he's going to pivot towards a softer form of Brexit. Uh, but bearing in mind that his coalition depends on keeping those Brexit leave voting white working class communities on side, I think uh, he's going to have to remember that, that he's going to have in mind that Ronald Reagan thing, you've got to dance with the one that brung you. And there is that sense of who sent him to Downing Street. He's going to be very aware of that. And how does he bring these conflicting demands together? Great. Thank you very much, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to pick up on, on, on some of that. Uh, I think... Oh, of the charts that, what, that you showed us, source, and one of the, the very interesting one was the extent to which uh, the foundations for this were actually laid in 2017. Uh, uh, and there was some confusion about that, I think, partly because Labour culturally decided that they won the 2017 general election, uh, despite the evidence suggesting that they didn't, because Theresa May became the Prime Minister. Um, but that, that, that sort of evidence base doesn't necessarily challenge the perceptions of some of Jeremy Corbyn's more uh, sort of hearty oh, supporters. Right. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we can come on to that. No, but the, the, the interesting thing about the shadow of that 2017 election is it culturally sort of hung over this election so much, um, not just because Labour thought they could sort of pull off the same again. I mean, uh, w w you know, by, they thought the Radical Manifesto in 2017 was terribly effective and they thought, well, if, if that worked, you know, if, if the electorate likes uh, tea with sugar, then maybe if we put a whole bag of sugar in the tea, then they'll like it even more. And they really misjudged, I think, on that level in terms of the offer to the country. Uh, and also that somehow, you know, if you just, maybe if they got to know Jeremy Corbyn a little bit more, um, then you could get that much further than you did in 2017. And I think these were terrible misjudgments, um, uh, at which anyone who went out and about canvassing, or not canvassing, just speaking to people, I don't support any party, but um, could, could detect. And I think the two very fundamental differences between this election and 2017 uh, that described, that anticipated the result that we've got were... Um, that in 2017, actually, Lee voters didn't really think that Brexit was in peril. They might have been a bit kind of baffled as to why it hadn't happened yet, because we voted for it. How difficult can it be? The answer actually quite difficult. But 
uh, you know, if, if, if you, the main thing you know about politics is you were asked a question in 2016 and you gave an answer. In 2017, Theresa May, you know, get Brexit done wasn't really the message because for a start, the Labour Party was saying they would get Brexit done up to a point. Uh, and there was just a general presumption it would happen. This time round, that really wasn't the case. Uh, and so Get Brexit Done was a tremendously effective message, uh, as Rachel said. And then the other point is the, 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 the country had got to know Jeremy Corbyn better and liked him less as a result. And this sense that you can't, when a dish has been sent back to the kitchen once, you can't bring it out again with more red ketchup over it and go, that's fine, now. will you eat it? They really didn't like it. Um, at, you clearly haven't eaten dinner in my house. <laughs> no, exactly, or, or, or tried to feed children. Um, yes, yeah, exactly. But... Um, uh, and as a result, you know, it, you know, hindsight bias is a wonderful thing. And so now we can all see that obviously this is what was what was going to happen. Um, I do there's this the sense that uh, there will now be a, a moment, hopefully, I would have thought of, of now of ownership of various people who were sort of thinking all sorts of things were available or possible that uh, that seemed improbable over the last two years n might now have to actually understand why those things were improbable. Uh, so, for example, I think you, you will see, one would hope, um, Remainers understanding quite the extent to which they actually failed to advance the argument for Britain's membership of the European Union over the past two years. Uh, and whether a, a terrible missed opportunity was galvanising around basically a kind of imperfect Norwegian option that could have been said to on a notionally uh, the, the task of delivering Brexit, I think actually an awful lot of Leave voters, I mean, there's, there's a free movement issue, but a lot of Leave voters would have just been satisfied with it having been done in almost any notional sense, so you could then move on. And the f anger and frustration was about the obstruction rather than any technical definition of what, what Brexit meant. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll credit David Gork with this metaphor, it's not one of mine, but he put it very well to me once, which was the, the, the sort of the a lot of the Remain-minded people in Parliament were like mountaineers who got sort of three quarters of the way up their mountain opposing a really hard Brexit and they could see the summit and rather than just stopping and going, okay, well, we've Theresa May's failed and we can maybe, maybe negotiate something a bit more sensible and stick with that, they thought, no, let's go all the way we can get to full referendum reverse Brexit and they didn't have enough oxygen to get to the top uh, and <clears throat> I think that has been exposed quite badly. It would be nice in terms of owning stuff if the... Uh, the, the Labour Party and, and the sort of the Corbyn wing of Labour Party would at least recognise now that you, you can't keep sort of hurling these propositions at an electorate that has been telling you on the doorstep and feeding back for a long time that um, at a very, at a sort of atavistic level, we don't want Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. Uh, that, was, that came across very, very strongly. Um, uh, and also that the... You know, you, you said, Torsten, I think you were right, that it, it's silly to have this conversation about was it Corbyn or was it Brexit? It was obviously both. But what's interesting is the way the two things combined, which is that it was Jeremy Corbyn's sort of slipperiness, ambivalence, failure to articulate something on Brexit, particularly when beneath that is the sense that fundamentally he is a, a lever from a left perspective. I mean, he thinks the European Union is part of this apparatus of post-war capitalist institutions that, that really are part of a sort of macro-imperialist project to, to oppress the workers. Um, that, as a conception of the European project, is not one that a lot of Labour members share. Um, it, it, and it, it fed this sense, not that the Labour Party had a bad position on Brexit, but that the articulation of the Labour position on Brexit absolutely hollowed out anything that was potentially good about the Corbyn brand 2015 to 16 when he was this open sort of avuncular just said it said it how he felt it um the, the, the sort of purchase you could have got with a Corbyn candidacy and did get a bit in 2017 which is that yes he didn't look like an ordinary politician but there were he had honesty and some of the polling in the early late 2015 early 2016 said he did very very well on you know, uh, empathy and not being like an ordinary politician uh, and the the obvious you know the, the sort of suffocated dishonesty of the Labour Brexit position 2018-19 absolutely destroyed what was left of Corbyn's brand I think um, and then just the final point then on owning things yes my Boris Johnson doesn't have to own get Brexit done, which, while a tremendously effective slogan, is not actually a particularly effective governance strategy on the terms that have been put in the 
to the Conservative manifesto, chiefly because you've committed to not extending the transition. And we can, you know, we probably all know the detail of why you need to, you know, very, very quickly, you, you get the legislation done, you're, at, you're a third country by the 1st of February. If you want to be realistic about a good trade deal, you're extending transition, then you're talking about pay to play in terms of single market access. You're having a really hard money conversation in Brussels by March. You know, so it's really, really hard. And then that just gets to, 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 to Rachel's point about this weird conversa- combination, new coalition you've got, which is basically, you know, in quotes, sort of Labour seats dressed in, in blue now. And it's a quite an awkward fit culturally and socially. And it's particularly an awkward fit because actually some of the economic ideological perspectives that's really driven Brexitism in the Conservative Party is a kind of radical libertarian proposition, which really, really is not going to go provide a, a policy prospectus that's going to satisfy kind of working to man uh, uh, or woman, uh, or particularly man, when you look at the demographics of who's actually voted Conservative, by the way, but we can come on to that. Um, so I think that the danger that the, the Conservative Party is now, because it doesn't have a kind of intellectual apparatus to do the redistributive economic policy to satisfy those people, it really falls back on the culture war stuff. And you look at how much something like support for the death penalty uh, is a good culture marker of who would be a, a leave voter in some of these seats that are now Conservative seats, uh, the, the pressure on, the cons- on, on, on Boris Johnson, you know, forget One Nation stuff, to just s- start ripping red meat off the carcass of a different type of politics and hurling it at that electorate because he doesn't know how to do the economics to satisfy those people, I think will be quite interesting. Okay, I was going to say thank you, but then you finished in the death penalty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, thanks very I'm much. I'll say that's a good idea, by the way. I'm just really <laughs> clear about that. <laughs> Tim, from death penalties to... Uh, well, um, I just want to echo some of the things that um, people said and then say uh, a few other things as well. I mean, I think um, Rachel's absolutely right that, you know, one nation is essentially a kind of empty signifier. It's a kind of essentially contested concept. No one really knows what, it's me- what it means. It's used as shorthand by various parts of the t- Tory party to indicate various things to various people. And quite frankly, I mean, we'll hear it said again and again over the next few weeks. Uh, but, you know, I don't know what it means and I'm supposed to know a lot about this party, so... Uh, if anyone can tell me answers on a postcard. Um, I would also say um, we have heard from David Cameron, from Theresa May, and we will also hear from Boris Johnson, we've already heard it from Boris Johnson, um, some kind of Damascene conversion on the steps of Downing Street uh, to a kinder, gentler, more moderate conservatism. And of course, we heard the same thing from Margaret Thatcher very famously when she quoted or misquoted Francis of Assisi. Um, You have to judge the conservatives, and this isn't the partisan point, by their deeds rather than their words. And what we know of the Conservative Party is that, generally speaking, if it has an ideology now, it is the same in some ways as its ideology has always been. In other words, you know, the main thing is to make it into office and then to spend as little money as possible consonant with getting the you know, broad support of the electorate in order to allow you to stay in office. It's, it's, it's not that much more complicated uh, than that, I, I think. And I, I don't think uh, we will see um, Boris Johnson do anything much more profound, and that's partly because of Brexit. Because of one thing that we do know about Brexit uh, and, and even most uh, uh, economists who may even have some sympathy with this, I, I don't think would argue that it is actually going to kind of raise the growth rate in this country in the short term. Uh, I, I mean, Torsten sitting next to me and knows this far better than me. But Brexit won't be a disaster in the sense of, uh, unless we crash out at the end of uh, December, kind of total disruption, you know, catastrophe. It will just be growth foregone. And growth foregone is tax revenue foregone. And tax revenue foregone means it's going to be very difficult to honour some of the spending pledges that the Conservatives have made. But, and this is, I think, a figure I got from the Resolution Foundation, Remember that for every £28 that the uh, Labour Party said it was going to spend in its manifesto, the Conservative manifesto promised to spend one. Okay, this is not the kind of you know manifesto that we would see. I think from a quote unquote um, you know one nation Conservative government. It just got them through the election. I don't think it is a blueprint for a, a different kind uh, of conservatism. Um, uh, 
I just want to uh, say a few things about some of the charts, or one of the charts in particular. I think the one on age is really, really interesting. Um, uh, no, it's okay. I'm not going to get uh, get techy about it. But you could also do the same with education. Okay, and we were talking about this uh, a little bit earlier. I mean, there is this very big divide now uh, between the, the the two tribes, if you like, of voters, uh, as well actually as party members uh, uh, when it when it comes to this. Now, there's two ways of looking at this. One is that it's a disaster at the moment for Labour because older voters, you know, tend to vote more than younger voters, uh, and there are still, broadly speaking, uh, I think probably more people at least who vote who don't have degrees uh, than have degrees, although I can't be absolutely sure about that. Now, the other way of looking at it is that in the long term, this is great for Labour. Because actually, if, if we see not um, uh, a kind of life cycle effect where people get more conservative as they get older, but we see a cohort effect of all these people who are now young and love the Labour Party carrying on loving the Labour Party as they get older, and basically all those old people who love the Conservative Party drop off the end of the electorate, let's put it like that, okay, <laughs> then at some point, uh, and, and this is also true as Britain becomes more multi-ethnic, Labour comes into its inheritance, if you like, in, in 10, 15 years' time, in the long run. But as Keynes said, in the long run, we are all dead, yeah? And Labour obviously has you know, had a near-death experience last night. Um, so uh, that poses problems for the Conservative Party as well. They do have to think about what they are going to do uh, in, in that situation, because it, it isn't a long-term viable strategy for the Conservative Party to, to double down in the way that they have, as, as Raf quite rightly said, on their 2017 strategy and just execute it more effectively. But for the Conservative Party, you know, as you look at it through history, they don't actually worry very much about the long term. And this comes back to my main point. The Conservative Party is an election winning machine designed to prevent socialists or social democrats getting into power and spending too much money and confiscating uh, too much private property, uh, as they would see it. So I'm not sure that the Conservative Party has done much long-term thinking about this, uh, or will actually do very much long-term thinking uh, about this. Um, I think uh, the, the points made about Corbyn, you know, are obviously absolutely right. And, and I, I think, obviously, Tostin's right when you know you say that it's a fruitless argument to say, was it Brexit, was it Corbyn? I think, you know, Raf makes a very good point that in some sense it was this sort of intersection uh, of the two things. And you can also point to the campaign, and, and since we're dissecting the election, I don't think we should forget that really Labour ran an amateurish campaign versus uh, a campaign run by consummate professionals this time around. I mean, they, they executed the strategy that in some ways um, uh, Linton Crosby had advised Theresa May to, to run last time around uh, with added Dominic Cummings, uh, as it were, sprinkled on, on top of it, um, which was incredibly effective against you know, Labour's giveaway a day Santa Claus manifesto, which we've already uh, talked about. So don't let's forget those short-term uh, um, uh, things there. Now, the, the question, and I'll, I'll sort of begin to end here, is obviously you know, what the Labour Party uh, does next. Um, and clearly that does have a lot to do with leadership, and maybe we can get into uh, that discussion uh, if we want to. But it doesn't just have to do with leadership, it has to do with membership as well. We have a membership in, in the Labour Party that still runs at probably about 450,000 people. Those 450,000 people are overwhelmingly, at least two thirds, one third, very, very keen on Jeremy Corbyn and Jeremy Corbyn's agenda. They are incredibly left wing. If you, if you, you know, give them the standard battery of questions that the British election study asks, they, they come out uh, way, way to the left of the median voter. And even more so, they are incredibly socially liberal, um, far more so than, than the median voter. Uh, now, is it possible for the Labour Party to uh, elect a leader, given that that is the electorate or the selectorate for that leader, that can bring them somewhere closer to uh, the median voter? You would think that the shock of this election defeat uh, might quote unquote, bring some people to their senses and make them realise that in fact they have to do things differently. But what we know about parties is that they very often don't learn first time around. 
And if you look at the... Um, the Which we third time around already. Yeah, okay, third time around already, <laughs> maybe. But you see... It, Way past that. But, but 20, 20, yeah, 2017 was a moral victory, right? You know, so uh, I think we have to... Yeah, we have to... We have to uh, include that. Now, if you look back at the Conservative Party, wiped out in 1997, w didn't really change, doubled down, elected William Hague, then, you know, lost then, elected Ian Duncan Smith, then Michael Howard. You know, parties don't learn very quickly. And if you've got, and, and in particular members, I think, don't learn as quickly as politicians because they're not necessarily in contact with quote unquote ordinary voters and constituents. So. You know, quite what you do to change the membership of the Labour Party, uh, I do not know. A, a few straws in the wind, though. Several people have said to me last night and this morning that they're joining the Labour Party. And these are people who left the Labour Party because of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, you know, if people want to change the Labour Party, then they're going to have to get in there and fight. Or a whole bunch of MPs, and I'm talking about the majority of Labour MPs, are going to have to walk and you know, put together some new formation. So you ended on the death penalty and you ended up on <laughs> possible death of a party. Yeah, a bit death yeah but, but death and anyway, rebirth. Well, thank death you as well. Yeah. yeah, okay. Right, so we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do three things quickly, then we're gonna go to some questions. We're gonna do uh, a bit of humility, uh, which we're gonna find difficult, but we, we can do it. Uh, we're going to do the ele election, just a few things to pick up, and then we're going to do the future. Okay. Right, so on humility, first of all, given that you know, we get to pontificate. So let's, like, what, what, in the, what in this did we definitely get wrong? So I'll go first, because like, you're thinking time. <laughs> what did you get wrong? Everyone has got something wrong in the last I've got couple. loads already. I know, I've got <laughs> right, So mine is, I thought it was impossible for Labour to lose by more than 10 points. And I've been saying that very confidently. I thought basically nine years in, weak economy, unpopular prime minister, like you run any... You look at any historical data, you don't lose by more than 10 points. I mean, losing at all is really hard, but losing by more than 10 points is like historically unparalleled. Uh, it turned out I was definitely wrong by a significant margin. Hmm. Who wants to join my humility bandwagon? I thought the Lib Dems would do better than yeah. they did. Um, and I thought, I mean, you remember when we went into the election, or just before the campaign, it was almost as if the four parties were equally divided at one point after the European yeah. elections. And I thought the Lib Dems would capitalise more on the Remain vote in the way that the Tories ended up doing on the Brexit vote. And of course what happened was the Brexit side united behind Boris Johnson and the Remain side remained divided, which is why we have the result we did. Yeah, I, th I thought the, the character flaws in Boris Johnson that seem to be exposed during the campaign. He's actually, he's got a shtick that works in the short term, but actually the sh brighter the light you shine on him, the more he kind of seems to curdle in many ways. And, and, even, and a lot of Tories will say, yeah, the, 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 more, you, you know, the, the more you get to know Boris Johnson, the less you like him. And I, I thought that would, have that, I, that would have a drag effect and that the sort of Heineken-Boris thing was a bit of a myth, worked with some people, didn't and, the other, and therefore that would, that would put a break on the yeah. Tory seats number. And whereas it turns out actually Boris did the Boris thing and it actually worked. Let's come back to that in a second. Or Corbyn, or, or, or Corbyn, Corbyn did the yeah, Corbyn maybe, maybe, thing even way, more I, extreme than Boris did the, the Boris the, thing. Yeah, the, 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 well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think I was wrong about the, the, the drag that I thought Johnson's own candidacy would have on the Tory vote. Okay. Tim? Um, to, well, to be honest, I, I mean, I, I just write about it all. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no. Uh, what I would say is complete and utter cowardice because I thought that the Conservatives would win by about thirty to forty, which was an underestimate. Um, but I wasn't really willing to say that in public, partly because of the twenty seventeen um, uh, result, which yep. kind of astounded all of us. Uh, and, yep. and I'm now rather annoyed that I didn't, obviously, <laughs> uh, because I look like some, yep. you know, uh, prognosticating uh, I think that is a, there's a general rule, which is political parties always draw the wrong lessons from the last general election campaign, and it turns out so do political experts. Yes. Everyone yeah. got too scared <laughs> of uh, saying very... Yeah, what, uh, but, but what was interesting is if you asked a lot of people in private who were supposed yes. to know about this, this stuff, they all said Conservative majority 30-40. Yeah. But could you get anyone to say that in public on Twitter, for example? No, you could. Uh, you know, so that was it turns out we care more about not yeah. being embarrassed. The, the other thing I would say as well, because I, 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 you know, I do a lot of research on party members, I, I think possibly I did think that uh, the, uh, 
the, the fact that Labour had a much larger, larger membership and more active membership and the fact that uh, the Lib Dems have got quite a large membership, certainly in proportion to their vote, and a very active membership might actually stymie some of the Conservatives' yeah. ability to, to, to win in, in some places. And then clearly... It, turned, it out ground, yeah. turned out ground war meant nada. Didn't mean as much as I thought it would, yeah. yeah. Which probably, hopefully means less tweeting about queues at elections and other things. <laughs> no? Yeah. No, no, sure. oh, yeah. All right. Okay, no, let's try... Let's, let's just do a few things about the actual election itself. So here's a different take on the election, okay, which is that, as it goes to what you're saying, Raph, about was Boris better than you were expecting, which is... How about this as a take, which is actually he didn't do that much better than we expected. He did pretty similar to Theresa May. Actually, the kind of real strategic genius here is Nigel Farage, which has shown that actually uh, the Tories can make some progress in the Midlands, but the thing that's taken seats really for the Conservatives is the Brexit Party taking shed loads of Labour votes in Doncaster, Bassett Law, Bolsover, uh, Blythe. And actually, this has got nothing to do with David Cameron reaching, sorry, um, uh, Boris Johnson reaching new people. And it's all about the Brexit Party hemorrhaging the part of the Labour coalition that they've been slowly losing anyway. And, basically, and so basically, although everyone thought he's looked like a bit of a numpty through this campaign, actually, if your objective was a Tory government, he did exactly the right thing. Well, I, I would I certainly, there was this idea, I remember George Osborne used to talk about sort of UKIP being a kind of gateway drug for getting people to vote Conservative, yeah. that there were these people who really ought to be Conservative in some way, but because of the sort of cultural inoculation from the 1980s against ever being a Tory in some of these parts of the world, they needed some other, some other mechanism, uh, and, and something like that, that does appear to have gone on. But I also think there is a danger, it's certainly you, you see it a lot now in, in sort of the, the wounded and disappointed Corbynosphere of people sort of saying these, these poor benighted Leave voters, they just don't understand, they're voting against their own economic interest, they've somehow been, you know, it's basically the old Marxist idea of false consciousness, they've somehow been, that, right? been sort of led astray. Uh, 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 and, and part of that is also it's like, oh, you know, oh, it's the Boris Johnson, have I got news for you effect, how could they be charmed by this idiot? Um, my sense is that's not really what's going on. I think a lot of people, they, they, some of these people have, have, must be Labour to Tory switchers. And a lot of it, I think, is just the understanding the force of what Get Brexit Done meant in terms of the democratic imperative and how culturally potent that 2016 moment was of people thinking, nothing makes a difference, but you've now put this big red button in front of me that said, this will make a difference. And they went, and they, people who hadn't voted before, didn't vote much, didn't vote with any enthusiasm, turned out, they pressed the button and then nothing happened. And they will now, a lot of those people will be thinking, I know that Boris is a buffoon or an idiot, I don't much like him, I really hate Jeremy Corbyn, but he's got the button and so I'm pressing it. And so they went into it with their eyes wide open. That is true, although there's just, there's just not a big move of a block of votes to the Conservatives that didn't vote for them in 2017. I suppose as long as they're not voting Labour, but sorry. sorry no, on. I'd say I make a different point. I think it was that <laughs> Labour lost their faith. So Brexit Party, Nigel Farage was the recipient of those votes, but actually the culprit, if you like, was Jeremy Corbyn, who had failed to win their confidence. And that wasn't just to do with Brexit. It was partly, as I think, as you said, Raph, to do with the sort of shenanigans and, you know, slipperiness on Brexit. Mm. But also to do with, he just didn't come across as patriotic. They didn't believe the manifesto because they thought it was sort of like free pot noodles next. You know, it was sort of like they didn't, it wasn't a credible offer, even if they liked the individual policies. And they didn't trust the Labour Party on the economy, and they didn't trust uh, Corbyn on national security. Mm. So it's his loss, almost, rather than no, as much as, or, as much as, or more than Nigel Farage's genius, or as much as Boris yeah, Johnson's gain. Can I, I, mean, I, I would echo that. I mean, I think for Labour, it's a sort of toxic combination of, of values voting and, um, and valence voting, in the sense of, you know, um, competence matters a great deal to, to the modern electorate, right? Um, we, we are quite rightly, I think, you know, uh, in a conversation about people's cultural values, all right? And, and you know, the way that they've shifted, uh, or the way that now the Conservative Party's values resonate with, uh, you know, the values of, of uh, people living in, in certain areas. But we should not forget that, that valence still exists, that judgments about competence still exist and are incredibly important for our electors. So we shouldn't run away with the idea that um, Corbyn lost and Johnson won simply because there's a whole bunch of people who are older and don't like immigrants, aren't very well educated, you know, want to uh, lock people up and throw away the key, etc. Et or kill them. Or maybe even, maybe even in, in, in the worst circumstances kill them. But, um, uh, <laughs> 
you know, I, I think through right a judicial to, process, yeah, something yeah. like this, <laughs> <laughs> something about, like roaming death. Yeah. Or. Well, I don't know. You, you, if you poll that, you might get. <laughs> anyway, um, but I mean, Rachel's absolutely right. They took a look at the Labour manifesto and they liked some parts of what they saw. But you know, when they looked at the sum of the parts, it just was not credible. Um, to people and they, they just didn't see how it could be done and didn't see how it could be delivered by this particular okay let's, put, let's let's dig into that a bit on so let's do labor manifesto its role so one conclusion is um the volume of stuff in the manifesto yeah, the give hit, away a day hit, yeah. hits yeah. hits the ability for them to believe that you're just like a credible person to do anything mm. and so it just hits you you uh, how, how, is a different version okay which is um what has been what have people learned between 2017 and 2019 when there was another radical labor manifesto i mean there was more in this one but so both but the other thing they've learned is that brexit and the big change it promised is just really hard and they are tired of it and one so one version which is for the tories get brexit done is a powerful message because lots of people want to get brexit done whatever they think about the actual outcome they just want this off the news maybe do we think that that feeling has then also changed people's attitude towards other big change. We just want, like, it's a version, we, we, like, yes, I might have wanted a kind of big economic change in 2017. I've now lived through two years of attempting to deliver big change on Brexit. It's a total turkey. So I just don't want, I don't want someone proposing massive change. Also, We've become it, was, change it felt like a sort of revolution that was going backwards rather than a future forward-looking revolution. So it was back to nationalisation, you know, it was big nationalisation public in 2017. Spending. There was, but it was, like everything was doubled down on, and you and they, too. yeah, yeah, but it, there were also there was didn't feel like a very modern revolutionary offer, uh, and I think yeah, maybe people had tired of the idea of creative destruction. I think that, that, that that's true to an extent. I mean, certainly that that would be an age difference, isn't it? I'm sure sort of the younger pro Corbyn voters would see it as a very positive revolution, and, and, and aren't that interested in if you say, but British Leylands, they don't care. You know, that's not they're not part of their uh, reference frame. Um, I think there is, but there is, and Boris Johnson did, his extraordinary achievement is to have fought this as a change election, given that on nine years of incumbency, I mean, it's crazy. Well, he, he basically, he's recruited a new party uh, and given it a blue rosette in, in that sense, in terms of his, his coalition and the seats he's got. But the got. change is to make politics go away. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and to have fought against your own record as a party of failing to do the thing you're promising people, which will be the change, the change being we don't have to talk about that thing anymore. It's an extraordinary piece of political kind of prestidigitation, which is also an extraordinarily difficult thing to say when you've been up all night. Yeah. Um, but you know, part of that also is, I think, the sense that Labour, and they sort of just about got away with this in 2017, but the intervening two years really damaged them, was this sense that you know, the, the impulse behind Corbynism is in, in, in Intrinsically revolutionary, they they literally want revolution um, uh, in in a very sort of orthodox, almost sort of Leninist way. Some of these people, um, and they just couldn't cope with the fact that the revolutionary impulse had been stolen from them by a different project, and a whole bunch of people. Know, so that we look at what the sort of the way someone like Dominic Cummings looks at Brexit, it is a oh, yeah, it's a radical upheaval, and it just wasn't really available as a sort of coherent or credible message for Labour to say, we understand that you want revolution and you voted for revolution in 2016 and you've got a sort of Theresa May technocratic bad revolutionary and now I've got Boris Johnson proper revolutionary, but that's the wrong revolution. We've got the different, better revolution over here. Come over here to the much tastier revolution. Uh, it, it was, it's, in a way, I mean, it's kind of madness. You can't, you can't say that. And so I think the, the, the difficulty Labour then had trying to get behind get Brexit done with a, a, a something that was equivalently radical but in a totally different direction. I think you, basically you put it better than I did. I think that's right. Okay, let's do, let's just do, um, uh, let's do the future. Let's do two subjects of it, so one for each party. So on the Conservatives, so you said, so their big task, let's, let's just do the government task and not the uh, how to win over left you economic voters that they've accidentally got <laughs> um, bit. But like, so on getting Brexit done, are they, in the course of the next year, much bigger than expected majority, just going to dump the RG, uh, sit us in either a long transition or a soft Brexit and waltz off to talk about other stuff? Or um, are um, the more fruit loopier parts of the party going to still get what they want? Well, can I, I say it slightly depends, well, it depends a great deal, in fact, on those new MPs coming into Parliament because we can assume that the ERG is sort of a fixed quantity but in fact those people coming into Parliament now on the Conservative side might actually expand the ranks of the ERG. Do, do you think there's been an ERG surge? 
uh, difficult to tell. I mean, I, I think I'd have to probably, to be honest, go to Conservative Home and start looking at their kind of little pen portraits of the candidates. But given what we know about what it takes to get selected as a Conservative MP now, it, it strikes me as very likely that these are people who are very gung-ho, hard Brexiteers. Uh, and some of whom might join the ranks of the ERG and therefore might object to Boris Johnson asking for any kind of extension to the transition. Uh, so, you know, he, he could still have problems, even though we assume that having expanded his majority, he can kind of see off yeah. the ERG, which was the Theresa May plan. That's why she went for the 2017 He can election. also say, so there's, there's the, the raw numbers, which is if there's, only, if there's only 30 of them, he can live without the 30. Yeah. But there's also just, he's one. They think he's there for five years, if not more. Yeah. So the patronage, the, the loss, he's, you're not in a Theresa May, yeah. like, I, I'm a loser, would you like to do as I tell you? Yeah. Like, it's a different yeah. dynamic but, as but, well as... A, but what we, what we also know from the work of you know, people like Phil Cowley, mm -hmm. who uh, is with me at Queen Mary, is, is that actually um, gratitude is a very perishable quantity, more perishable than it was uh, in, in the olden days, as it were. MPs are, are much more likely to rebel and rebel quickly uh, than they used to be. So I, I don't think there's any guarantee that simply because they've come in on Boris Johnson's coattails, yeah. he will be able to kind of do with them as he will. They're like children. Mm. Uh, like to, <laughs> lack of parental gratitude. Right. Uh, yeah. I think, sorry, just quickly on that, uh, Boris Johnson doesn't believe in very much, apart from his own himself and his own self-advancement, but to the extent that he became a Brexit believer and, and has attached himself to that cause. The Brexit that he believes in is a very hard Brexit and mm. uh, particularly the, the, this, this sort of point that you know, the, the common external tariff as the ultimate evil that stops you from doing independent trade deals, particularly with the US, uh, once you've accepted that and as your red line ideologically for Brexit, um, the, what flows on from that in terms of how you won't want level playing field provisions with the EU and how you do with what's available to you in terms of single market access, even if you can somehow blur the December the 2020 deadline, you're locked into a very hard Brexit anyway. So in a way that kind of can he do to the Spartans what he did to the DUP, um, you know, notionally of course that's available to him, will the next two or three months you know, what will be the more powerful driver? Will it be you know, basically the Treasury and a bunch of other people saying, you now actually have to understand how important the single market is to this country, can you grow up please? Or will it be, we can get some symbolic recognition from Washington about what might be available in a trade deal and start agreeing things that will basically lock you out of proper integration. There's never going to be a US trade deal. No, not in terms of, uh, but just the commitments that could be made Concrete. that could then politically drive you very quickly away from integration. Just to push EU. back on slide, just, do we know Boris Johnson really thinks that? What we know is that Boris Johnson, since the summer, has been planning to fight exactly this general election, where the most important thing was that he could not be presented as in any way not the Brexit authentic voice. And he's done at every stage what he needed to do to make sure that when we got to this point, he could say that. Do we know that he actually cares about the substance on the common external tariff? Well, I would, I, I would say you look back at what he was saying for a lot longer now. What are the, what are the conceptual frame of his Euroscepticism yeah. going back to when he was writing for the Telegraph? It is the, the sort of, the, it's, it's the sort of militant wing of it's all political correctness gone mad. It's all red tape stopping us. Yeah. It's that bu buccaneering idea. It's right. basically cr crass Liam Foxism is right. actually where he comes from. But I think from. there's I'm a really, really there's a really interesting clash you're going to see yeah, in the cabinet, but also within Boris Johnson and how he keeps the new coalition together with those instincts. Because he can't the the new Tory voters they care about workers' rights. They care about regulations and all these rules that the EU give us. So if, when he comes to a trade deal, whether it's with Donald Trump or anyone else, if he goes to the lowest common denominator, he's going to alienate the very people he's won over. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think he's in a really awkward position. He may be boxed in by more than just the ERG. That's true, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Has a prediction on that basis. So they said they'll do a small reshuffle today, so let's assume nothing interesting happens apart from Michael Gove gets an extra long title or something. Okay. Rishi, Rishi, Rishi Sunak for... Rishi Sunak oh. gets a really long title, <laughs> but like a, a free house or something. The, um, no, uh, that we get the proper reshuffle in February, like after Brexit has happened. Bye-bye Preeti Patel, bye-bye Dominic Raab from the big offices of state, and he attempts to form a more normal government without the remaining libertarians, because the libertarians are a problem yeah. in the end on domestic policy. At what point? And on Brexit policy. And on Brexit, yeah. if, if he wants to move off his position. And, and, and what do you do about the Treasury? I mean, that's going to be a massive issue. As, as an institution that just understands this stuff and is being ground down and increasingly frustrated by 
you know, being required to confect an economic, basically confect an analysis to fit a political narrative that most people in the Treasury think doesn't work. I mean, that is, that at some stage, that's got to... Okay, so now we've solved the Tories. Um, right, Labour then briefly. So let's just keep this really simple. Right. There's, there's two scenarios. There's uh, Labour doesn't learn because it takes like 20 years. And let's not do the kind of... I don't mean learn in the simple sense of like, do they go to the centre or whatever. Mm -hmm. But let's just do it. A learn as in think having a perpetual civil war is not a good basis for going to the country. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really simple lesson. You don't need to be like take a view on whether it's too left or too right or whatever. It's just like if you spend your time screaming at each other, at some point the country doesn't look at you as a wanting to govern them particularly. So how 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 where is the tension between we really don't we really freaking hate each other, Brexit. It was all Brexit. It was all Corbyn. It was all Brexit. It was all Corbyn. Or uh, this having not having a broad left coalition makes it impossible to form a government. We're going to sort it out. Who wants to give us their prediction? Oh, oh, well, no, I was just picking up what Tim said earlier. I think a really good way of, of conceiving this, you said two-thirds of the membership are very corbyn yeah. and I think that's right, but actually it really helps if you break that down into actually the three-thirds, where you have a sort of remaining pragmatist wing, people who sort of voted for Owen Smith in 2016 mm. and are just, they're Labour till they die and that's what they do, but they're actually unhappy with what's gone on. But then the other two-thirds, which is your corbyn bit, are actually the sort of ideologues, the sort of people who were selling hard left newspapers in Camden Lock in the 1980s and just still always there, uh, a proper Marxist. And then you've got the idea... Apologies if anyone sitting in the audience. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> also, just to be clear, Camden Lock has changed a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the 1980s, I mean, a lot. Yeah. Like, it, the prices are much higher. Okay. And then, so ideologues, idealists, so, you know, and a, a big age range there, they're not all, you know, youth quakers can be a bit over-mythologised, but yeah, they're pe momentum -y people, a lot of them, people just dis either discovering socialism for the first time, or by socialism, they sort of mean some mulchy idea of generally being nice. And they, what they don't mean is that the wrong Germany won the Cold War. Um, and what, what happened in 2016 with the Owen Smith campaign is the pragmatists, they got everything completely wrong. And when they attacked the ideologues for being mad and supporting the IRA and all the rest of it, um, and, and Corbyn particularly, because the idealists had attached a lot of their sense of emotional identity to Jeremy, mm. They were pushed towards the ideologues because they felt pra pragmatic criticism of ideologue was attack on identity of idealists. So what's going to happen? Come on, that's the okay, well, so, but basically, It's easy to describe the past. Yeah, and, and, and what the pragmatists thought was that Remain would be a wedge between the idealists and the ideologues. Now, what's interesting now is Remain is basically dead as a political proposition. And so I think the capacity for a drift from the, of the idealists back towards a pragmatic position and peeling them away from the ideologues, especially now that the ideologues are out there going, literally nothing is wrong here, this is completely fine. It's a, it's a hundred mile march, we've only taken the first step. Everyone shut up and get behind Jeremy. will help now push those idealists back towards the pragmatic Okay, so, so that means you're... So you're rejecting my nice binary choice between a love-in versus a civil war and saying but the, the, a slow drift back towards a different two-thirds, one-third. No, I think the, 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 prospects that the, yeah, the prospect that the membership is actually more amenable to, to uh, something other than what Len says is, is, is maybe underpriced at the moment. But that's I feel like but they are heading for civil war still, perpetual, for quite a long time. And I think it's unresolved. The, 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 already the sort of Corbynites, both of your two thirds, they're making excuses for what happened, whether it's Brexit or identifying it as Jeremy Corbyn the man rather than Corbynism the project. Um, and I think until they come to terms with the fact it's also Corbynism the project, in whether it's political or identity, uh, then they're going to carry on rowing. Hmm. Tim, Rachel wins a prize for a clear answer. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. That was my subtle dig, but I'm glad you recognised it. <laughs> I, I still wouldn't um, completely discount the possibility of a large number of Labour MPs, even the majority of Labour MPs, um, splitting the party and, and, and taking trying to take the party with them, as it were. And are you sure that the harder left, I don't know which one of these thirds it fits into, doesn't see that that is a real possibility? And John McDonnell says, I don't. Well, I, think I don't want just me and Richard Bergen left in the party. Yeah. And the members. Yeah. And so I and so that so I pre a preempt return of civil war. Yeah, I mean I think that that is a possibility. And John McDonnell, it seems to me, you know, whatever's spoken about him does seem to have emerged as a as a, a rather more canny uh, and responsible and kind of far sighted 
um, politician, and I think many people, you know, cast him as when he first took over with Jeremy Corbyn. So that's possible, but it it does remain a possibility that if how many MPs did they get in the end? Two hundred and three, is it yeah. something like that? You know, one hundred and twenty Labour MPs just think, you know, this this game isn't worth the candle. They become the new Labour Party. Right. Let's get some questions. And if you want to throw in the answer to that last question, or to the are the Tories going to do a hard Brexit or not? <laughs> let's start right at the back over here. And where's the other mic gone? Come on. Adam, there's two just over there. We'll take both of them. Go ahead, sir. Give us your name. Hi, uh, Andrew. Uh, I've got a question about, um, I think, regardless of whether this election campaign was just played out of a traditional media, the result would have been the same. But there's been a lot of um, journalism about, um, you know, dark advertising, use of data, um, possible breaches of electoral law. What incentive is there currently to change any of that? And, and <laughs> what does this mean for democratic practices in elections in the future? Let's broaden that into the abolish the BBC kind of argument that's mm. like around on the left and the right. Can you guys go ahead? Yeah, and, and, and Anita Charlesworth uh, Health Foundation, I wanted to ask, you haven't talked about the other seismic change in this election, which is that the Conservative and Unionist Party have won in England, but nationalists yeah. have won in Scotland and, in fact, in Northern Ireland for the first time. Yeah. And one of the key challenges, I guess, over the next five years is how to do Brexit keep the Tory party together and hold the union together. And I wanted the panel's view about uh, that dimension. Big question. Uh, I just wanted to say I respect you very highly and I thought I'd get that in there before I say I think you're hopelessly wrong on Corbynism. I think that... Uh, you talked to anyone in particular? I'm just like, I think the entire panel okay, unanimously fine. agreed that... But you respect the, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, seriously, that's what the country needs a bit more of. <laughs> General um, respect, then abuse. In general, the, the Corbyn agenda, I don't see how you can reconcile your criticism of it when, uh, in general terms, the discussion on public spending has shifted, including the Conservative Party, since Corbyn took over. I'm not going to apologise for Corbyn. I think he is the reason why there was a catastrophic defeat yesterday. But the idea that the Corbyn agenda is flawed, uh, I'd like to break it up into 2017. The reason why they did so well is because the manifesto was a big part of that and it went on domestic policies and okay. Theresa May went badly, I'll speed this up. 2019, how do you reconcile the manifesto and his agenda being the reason why he failed when the winner of this election had no agenda? Gary Gibbons sat here just three weeks ago and said they purposely uh, had nothing in their manifesto. Yep. Um, and his policies have been very popular in the polling. So yep. how do you reconcile those facts? The Corbyn okay. agenda, Corbyn was bad, the Corbyn agenda Great. isn't. Thank you for your question and for your respect. Now, let's start on media. So there's two aspects. There's, there's the... The mainstream media is just like a disaster, uh, and then there's a the new media is being is ex, is susceptible to there's like the Hillary Hillary Clinton argument. The, the new the new media is susceptible to abuse. You can fund adverts without being part of the formal regulatory process. What is going on? How big a problem? Which is Which was it? very central to the Vote Leave success and this election. One of the former Vote Leave chief technology officer was running dark ads saying vote green in certain constituencies, vote SNP in Joe Swinson's constituency, etc. Uh, in, in a way, one of the things that worried me most in Boris Johnson's very flaky manifesto was the stuff he, they talked about on democracy, parliament and government and have, reviewing all that relationship, actually. And I think, uh, separate to the whole media at one level, but they're linked. You know, what are they going to do? I think that's something that, as a sort of liberal instinctive person, small l, I think that could be something very worrying with the big majority. Uh, and you could easily have clashes coming along with the Lords on that kind of issue. And I think that's something really to keep an eye on. Raph, is the BBC getting abolished? Uh, well, it was quite impressive in a way, in a sort of dark way, that the Conservatives managed to essentially threaten both Channel 4 and the BBC in the final week of an election campaign. I mean, that, that was, that's kind of you know, Victor Orbanism, really, isn't it? Uh, you know, incipient. So you, you would be a little bit worried. Um, and I certainly, it's, it's part of a broader concern that if you wanted to be, you know, worry a lot about what a majority Conservative government might do. Uh, the, the capacity, yeah. the freedom that you have with that majority to really just start re-engineering you know, the state to make sure you never... Is he really going to do that? Well, no, I mean, why, what, 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 there's no particular obligation. I mean, and you can do the, you do the boundary changes before you do anything else to try and make sure you never lose, lose yeah. power. So, um, I'm, I'm, and 
I think ultimately an attack on the BBC you know, in a small C conservative way it would just really alienate people. People, especially these voters that are voting conservative now, they, they, they do like the BBC. Right. You know, it's basically you can't start attacking people. That was a distraction right. tactic, wasn't it? On but the day the, of the little boy in the hospital. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. But, um, on, on, and on the, the, the fitness for purpose of electoral law, that is obviously an enormous problem. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I slightly worry that there's a tendency to excuse political failure on the grounds that you know, Dominic Cummings did something terribly clever on Facebook and that meant that yeah. our, our project didn't win. I mean, the most effective thing was get Brexit done and that was a classic old school air war, brilliant piece of slogan, nice in campaigning. Okay. That, that really did. Tim, it. on Anita's very large question on the union. Yeah, I mean, we, we are going to see a, a collision here, aren't we? Um, there's no doubt that uh, Brexit is going to uh, increase demands, certainly by the Scottish Nationalist Party, if not Scottish voters generally um, for a second independence referendum. Uh, we know Boris Johnson has said that he will not grant that referendum. Uh, and clearly, he doesn't want to be seen as the Conservative Prime Minister who, quote unquote, loses Scotland. On the other hand, I think that if uh, I were a, a British Prime Minister, I would look across to Spain and see what happens if you deny the right of self-determination to a component part of your country that clearly wants to at least you know, explore or exercise that right. Uh, I'm not sure that it can actually be um, put off uh, forever. And I'm not sure uh, the argument that has some intellectual coherence that you've already had a chance to vote on this. You said it was for a generation. Uh, so you know, you, you've had your chance and you blew it. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure that's going to wash if you have opinion polls showing that very large numbers of people in that country want out. The question I think will be what happens with Brexit and how that impacts on the Scottish uh, electorate and their opinion. Because if Brexit uh, does turn into a bit of a uh, shit show, then... Uh, sorry. This is on daytime TV. Sorry. Um, <laughs> And he then, respected you until you did Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I used to teach him, so he's got no respect for me at all. Uh, that but, explains it all. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if Brexit suggests that breaking away from your closest economic partner is a very, very bad idea, we can't necessarily say that Brexit will encourage Scottish people to, to vote for independence. So I think that's, that's important. But, I mean, the, the implications of a Scottish breakaway are huge, as we all know, not, not just for the constitutional, but you know, for our defence and security policy, they are massive. Well, I want to get a few more questions, so just, I'm failing to answer your question, but just to be clear, so these slides don't tell you, nothing we've put out says anything about what the agenda, the role of the policy agenda. Mm. Oh, can I, can I, can I, oh, yeah, go on, I just wanted to say something. I'm very excited. That. Yeah, I just wanted to say something. bloody good now. No, it's, well, I mean, I think you will hear this argument um, from uh, core ministers, and it comes from this sort of Gramscian idea that even if you fail to win an election, you shift the common sense, okay? You actually make the Tories fight on your ground on the economy and public services or something. I think that's bullshit, as I say. Seriously. Oh, sorry. Seriously. <laughs> because, but yes, sorry. Like because apologise. Yeah, sorry. You know, because I, I hope. sorry. Because yeah, right. Because poor children. Yeah. Why did someone think of this? Yeah, you, they've got bigger problems. Yeah. You, you told me this was Peppa Pig, mummy. Um, but. Um, you know, I, I think the idea that the Conservatives have somehow adopted the, you know, the, the kind of Corbyn uh, agenda and are, are going to spend far more money in the, the economy is just nonsense. Very quickly, I would slightly def defend that point, actually. I do, and I should have made it clear that I think actually on the domestic agenda, one of the, a lot of Corbynism has obviously been very effective. I would leaven that also. I think 2017, there's a tendency to among supporters of Jeremy Corbyn to underweight how much of that Labour vote was just Remainers lending their vote to the Labour Party because that was the Remain thing to do in that election. All right, let's get some more questions for you. Um, and there's a lady in the middle. Where's the, where's the other mic gone, Rumi? Go ahead. Uh, hi, Connor. I was just wondering, um, you've mentioned a few times, Rachel, about uh, the Conservatives switching and having to the balance between economics and um, how that's going to work. But, like... The voters knew what they were voting for. Like Lee Anderson has said that he wants to bring back, well, mentioned Labour camps and didn't talk. Like they, the working class know about the effects of universal credit and pension, but they voted for it. So they, surely they're still quite happy to go along with what they voted for. So is that the question? Is, is are the working class really voting? Are they really, are they really going to be put off by the Conservatives saying we're not going to raise universal credit, we're not going to do this on pensions? Because they voted for it. Okay, and then 
Um, uh, perhaps slightly to the uh, tangential, but and not being an apologist for um, Boris Johnson, but his um, approach to North of Ireland was very strategic because you're forgetting he met with Faradka, the Toshik, and what went on at that meeting hasn't come back. But he put in a very respected academic from Queen's University in Belfast into the negotiations. And it was quite clear, since I come from there, that there was a move to the middle, away from the DUP and extremes. And um, that has proven fruit, and there has been um, a big change in North Ireland. And I think that was strategically astute of him. I think it's interesting. I mean, I'll, I'll take that one first, because that's a really important fun question. I have a slightly different take on what happened, which is, uh, in the end, the Conservative Union Party, Unionist Party cares about a Conservative government here. Delivering Brexit was key to that, and they would have hung the Unionists out to dry uh, at any opportunity in the past. And he happens to have just been the guy that, and they couldn't because they need the DUP in Parliament. But by that point, he'd already lost Parliament, and so he just hung the unionists out to dry. And I think my personal view is, leaving aside what you think about the individual things, but the idea that in Northern Ireland we ever hang one whole community out to dry is like a dangerous uh, game to be playing. But what do I know? Well, he's given that one. Okay, that's true. Right now, now. okay, the, um, let's cover. On the other point. Yes. Um, I, I, th I think um, what a lot of the voters were saying in the focus groups I heard about was that um, they were lending the Conservatives, lending Boris Johnson their vote to get Brexit done. In fact, he alluded to that, didn't he? He said, I, you, you've lent me your votes, I'm very grateful. So the issue really now, they weren't really voting on a lot of the other issues. They, were, they thought he was the person who would get Brexit done get this whole nightmare over and they were just loaning him their support but if he wants to keep um, that coalition together and stay in power he's going to have to to keep that support and persuade them not just to lend the vote but to give it uh, at least at the next election so that's when the other issues would kick in I'd say. Any last words for you guys? Um, well I think that that point is fundamentally important I just uh, on, the, on, the, on the Northern Ireland thing I would just say the glimmer of a positive thing. I've seen the SDLP come back a tiny bit. It's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice. But to uh, well, I, I suppose just one. something positive, not a death. Well, I did. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, no death. Uh, no, no death and no swearing. No swearing. Um, I guess, I mean, if you're a, a Labour person, and it comes back to something actually uh, both, both my fellow panellists have said, it, is that uh, at the moment, the coalition that Boris Johnson seems to have constructed is actually not an unfamiliar one if you're familiar with the, the history of the Conservative Party is you throw kind of cultural red meat to working class voters uh, and you know you keep on board uh, your better off voters because of what you can actually deliver them uh, economically. Now there may be a tension between those two groups that actually in the end proves uh, irreconcilable. So if you're a Labour voter that that perhaps you know gives you some cause for hope, irrespective of what you yourself do. Okay. There's always the possibility that the other side can mess up. Very good. You showed self-control there. We yes. respect that. <laughs> right. Can we thank our panel for their thoughts and insights and definitely? I hope you all enjoyed your election. More importantly, I really hope you enjoy your Christmas more than that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>